You're very welcome to this episode of the Credo series. Tonight we're coming from St Mary's Priory in Talla, a very special place for us Irish Dominicans because it's the mother house of the Irish Dominican province. And we're here to discuss that final great line of the Creed. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And it's my pleasure to introduce Father Terence Crotty, who will shine some light for us on this great mystery. So, okay. Father Terence, our belief in the resurrection, our resurrection, is the most important statement that we can make. Because it is really in this that we see that the life, death and resurrection of Christ has absolutely changed our history and our reality. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, what's interesting about the resurrection of the dead is that um, it's the second resurrection that we profess faith in. Mm. First of all, we have the resurrection of Christ himself and then at the end we profess um, faith in our own resurrection. And when St. Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, many scholars would say that he actually um, not only met the living Christ and therefore became conscious of, of Christ himself as risen, yeah. but that he was all, also um, filled with a, a knowledge of our own resurrection, that, that thanks to the resurrection of Christ, that, that we too rise from the dead. Lovely. So in the first letter to the Corinthians, when, when St. Paul is, has been questioned about uh, whether there is a resurrection from the dead, he doesn't first of all speak about the, the resurrection of Christ, and he doesn't first of all insist on the resurrection of Christ, but he actually first of all insists on the resurrection of us, yes. that we are the ones who, who rise from the dead, thanks to the resurrection of Christ. In other words, his, his instinctive reaction when the resurrection is questioned is to defend the resurrection of, of the Christians, um, as well as, as, well as the, the resurrection of, of Christ. And also in the letter to the Romans, when St. Paul speaks about Christ being raised from the dead by, by the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. he adds immediately that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through the spirit who dwells in you. So St. Paul is very conscious that the, the one resurrection flows into the other. And what's perfectly clear in, in life is, is First of all, that everybody must die. Yes, that's something okay. everyone will agree with you on. Yeah. <laughs> so that is the great promise, unfortunately, that, that life makes to us. And do we think about this? Yes, to an extent we do think about it, to an extent we don't. There's uh, one of the most famous philosophers of the 20th century, a man by the name of Martin Heidegger, mm. described human life as being a being towards death. So it's like somebody going on a journey and uh, the journey is very pleasant beautiful things to be seen, beautiful things to be done, but at the end of it, oh, it yeah. ends in nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And so to an extent, we, we do think about death. On the other hand, to an extent, we, we forget about this, especially when we're young, that we forget the, the fact that, that life is going to come to an end. Which it inevitably we will, yes. And do you think then that we turn a blind eye to the issue of life and death? I think we have a, a tendency to turn a blind eye, especially in a society where faith isn't strong anymore. Yes, it's just concerned with the now and what's in present, yeah. Yes, and then we often find the, the phenomenon that people who have no faith yeah. actually turn around and if somebody dies belonging to them, they're quite sure that that person is at peace. Yes. So for us who believe in the resurrection of the dead, who profess faith in Christ, we have a good reason to believe in the resurrection of the dead. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, really modern society turn, turns a blind eye towards the issue of life and death. And I think one of the, the beauties of the doctrine of the resurrection is that it allows us to look death in the face yes. and to say that, that death is this terrible thing which is going to happen to us, but nevertheless that, that Christ in his resurrection and in giving us the resurrection too has freed us from the necessity which, which modern society finds of, um, of ignoring the resurrection yes. of the dead and ignoring the, the whole issue of life and death and the death that comes. Do you think then that we turn a blind eye to the whole issue of life and death? I think modern society, especially when it has no faith, mm. has a tendency to, to turn a blind eye certainly towards death and to really wish away death in a sense, either not to think about it or to, um, or to assume that when death occurs that it's simply something not of great importance. Yes, it's not really tackled or dealt with directly. No, mm. 
a friend of mine recently um, who has no faith, a relative of his who also has no faith died. And he made the comment to me that while he was sad to see the person go, he was glad that at last he was at peace. Yes. And for us Christians who believe in the resurrection of the dead, we have a reason to believe that there is this, this peace which follows death, that, that the Lord saves us. For somebody who has no faith, there is really no reason because um, we simply don't know what lies yes. on the other side of, of death if, uh, if the, unless we know it through faith. And this really is part of the beauty of the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, that it allows us to, to face the issue of death and at the same time to, to laugh at it, in a sense. Not, the, not that death is, is an easy thing in itself, but that our knowledge that, that Christ has conquered it and that there is on the other side of, of death uh, a resurrection from the dead. Yes, as well. it gives it a context we'd never otherwise have that, you would, that a person of faith could never really see. That's certainly true. And if you look at religions of, from around the world, none of, them, none of the ancient religions would have a consciousness of life beyond death, of resurrection from the dead, as much as Christianity would, yeah. which, which takes its, its um, lead in this from Christ himself and from his resurrection. So the resurrection of the dead is, is something that, that changes us and changes the whole of culture. Yes. in a way that um, gives, gives us a perspective we'd otherwise not have. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead teaches us is not that death becomes a good thing. Yes. Jesus in his agony in the garden obviously was afraid of, of death. And um, when, he, when Lazarus died, he wept outside his tomb, even yeah. though he knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Very evocative image, Christ weeping, yeah. Absolutely. So, so death isn't transformed into something good. But at the same time, it becomes a threshold across which we go or, or an invitation through which we are invited to, to see God, to see God face to face. And that is what the Catechism says when it's talking about the resurrection of the dead, that, that death becomes an invitation. So it's no longer what Heidegger or the existentialists would say is complete annihilation, yes. but it becomes that invitation to a, a greater life that Christ has has in a sense, tamed death, or you might even say, uh, converted death into a, a weapon for his own use. Yeah, a gateway onto, onto, onto the beyond, onto heaven. Um, we speak of the resurrection of the body, Father Terence. Now, one might, might have thought that having an immortal soul would have been good enough, but it's very clear that we have an immortal body, where our body is going to be resurrected as well. And what comes to mind here is that great early Christian writer Tertullian's line, you know, where he says, the flesh is the hinge of salvation. I'm just wondering maybe if you could give us maybe some insight into the, our resurrection, how we're going to be resurrected in the flesh. I think it's certainly very true to say that often we forget that we profess faith in the resurrection of the body yeah. and not simply eternal life as a spirit. Yeah. And to, to look at this belief and to think what it means that God has taught us this, that God wishes that we should rise from the dead bodily and not only exists spiritually yes. is uh, quite revealing, really revealing of the, of the dignity of the, of the human body and revealing of the fact that God has created us body and soul, yes. that he hasn't simply created us as, as souls imprisoned in a body in a sense, but, but body and soul. And of course the, the word became flesh in order to redeem us, so I mean. Yes, so much of the, of the Christian mystery is based around the flesh in, in that sense that Heidegger spoke of, of the flesh as the hinge of salvation, that, that salvation in a sense latches on to the whole idea of, of the bodiliness yes. of, of human beings. And Christ, as you say, he, he takes on himself a human body, he becomes human in an absolute sense, true man and true God. And it's in his death, the death of his body, that he saves us. And in his resurrection from the body, of the body that he gives us new life ourselves and also in this sense it helps us to see why the center of our worship is being fed with the body of Christ mm, ourselves very good yeah. that uh, because the flesh is the hinge of salvation that that God is redeeming not only our souls but also our bodies yeah. through the mass and through feeding us with his own body and blood
which is the centre of our lives as, as Catholics. Yes. So the creed also speaks about life everlasting. But in doing so, it also speaks about our final judgment. Could you maybe say something to us about that, Father Terence? I think the whole issue of judgment at the end of our lives is so instinctive in human beings in general. Mm, very much so. That even Plato, who was a pagan, a pagan philosopher in ancient Greece, um, had himself a, a myth of judgment. He, he wrote a, a mythology of, uh, in which we were judged, people were judged according to the deeds they had done in life. And we see that too in, in modern secular society, which has no real belief in God and to an extent rejects the idea that, that God would judge. But still we find that, that people judge and, and society becomes quite unforgiving towards uh, people in, in certain categories, people who are easily condemned, that the, ho the whole idea of judgment is still instinctive there, mm. that we still have a, an instinctive reaction that, that justice will be done and should be done. Sure. And I think that is part of the, the Christian understanding really that, that Christ in imposing justice on the world, in being a just God, mm. will, will judge us also. I suppose one of the, the great problems though is to reconcile this sense of judgment and justice being dealt with this um, image of an all-loving, infinitely loving and merciful God. Yes, absolutely. St. John of the Cross, as he's quoted in the Catechism, says that uh, in the evening of our lives we'll mm. be judged on love. And so this is precisely what judgment is. It's a comparison of our love with the infinite love of Christ. And Cardinal Newman in particular says that judgment is, is based on Christ and it's based on the love of Christ that Christ showed in bringing himself to the cross. That how will our love compare with that? And there's a beautiful line in the Roman breviary on the office of all souls, which says, remember those, O Lord, who in your peace have died, yet may not gain love's high reward till love is purified. And these are the souls in purgatory that we speak of, the yes. souls who are judged. Yeah. They may not gain love's high reward till love is purified. And all of us are familiar with the idea that love should be purified. So we might do a good deed for somebody yes. and because we love them, but then we also realize that there's something else in there that um, maybe we're doing it for an ulterior motive to <laughs> avoid helping out somebody else yes. or to gain some sort of recompense somehow or other, that it's not a pure love, it's not a pure goodness. So we're quite aware in our everyday lives of the necessity of purification. And this is what the doctrine of purgatory speaks about, okay. this, this necessity of, of purification of love, so that in some sense it is uh, to the love of Christ. And the, the tradition of the church in her teaching is that when a soul is, is dies and meets Christ, then it is judged in the sense that uh, it will go either to heaven or to hell or to purgatory. Mm. And of course, this is difficult for us to imagine that, that any soul in, in the embrace of a, an infinitely loving God would go to any place but heaven mm. and immediately. To an extent, um, what purgatory is really is a, is a function of the love of Christ that it is a place both where the, the soul becomes conscious of uh, the love of Christ yes. and therefore of the necessity of purifying their own love. And heaven, of course, is, is easily understood that heaven is, is simply being a, a place where we are with God. So nothing more, really nothing than that. Yeah, and beautiful and it's a statement of the, of the infinite beauty of God, exactly mm -hmm. as you say, and the infinite goodness of God that, that heaven is simply to be there. I often think of purgatory being a little bit like a person who, um, who I meet who is heroic and in being a, a hero in terms of carrying a sickness or um, carrying a, a, a sorrow or something like that, but, but doing so with great joy and great peace and great serenity, I'd be so much in admiration of that person and at the same time I might even be a little bit embarrassed about myself yes. that I'm such a wimp. <laughs> or that I'm so selfish or something like that, that the person's goodness would underline my own selfishness. Yeah. And so therefore, in that sense, I experience purgatory here where I am, that this, this uh, wonder of the, of the good person and also the sense of some shame in, in my own lack makes me change. Mm. 
Yes. It purifies me in a, in a sense and it, it gives me a higher ideal of, of what it is to be good and at the same time highlights my own, my own uh, places where I fall down. And so here in this life too we experience purgatory. We experience a, a type of purification of our own love through the, the experience of meeting people who are so much better than we are. And the doctrine of purgatory is really just like that except mm. uh, expanded because the, the person that we meet is Christ himself uh, on the day of our death. And in meeting Christ we're meeting the love of somebody who took himself to the cross, yes. who was willing to take up the cross for love of me, for love of you, for love of all of us, this, this love which is beyond our understanding. And what will, we, what will be our experience when we're yes. in front of that love? So Prophet Isaiah in the sixth chapter of the book of the Prophet Isaiah says that when he, when he sees the vision of, of the Lord in the temple, he doesn't respond simply by, um, by exulting or anything like that, but actually he's, he's afraid. He, he feels the place tremble. And St. Peter too, when he first meets the Lord Jesus who, who works this great miracle, um, St. Peter also um, is afraid and he says to the Lord, Lord, go away from me. I am a sinful man. Yes. And in a sense, yes. therefore, we can see the, the whole experience of purgatory. This um, encounter with absolute love and how it absolutely. reflects on ourselves. Yeah. yeah, how it reflects on ourselves, exactly. And um, this is something we can appreciate from this life. And so, to an extent, the doctrine of purgatory is something that we meet in our everyday lives Amazing. ourselves. Um, and, and so it's, it's not something that's going to be completely foreign to us uh, when the church teaches it as a doctrine. And I suppose another aspect of purgatory is they have the certainty of gaining heaven. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, so there is that, that love and that, uh, that joy of having met Christ and that desire to purify themselves so that they would be worthy of being with him. Thanks very much for that, Father Terence. We'll stop just now for a break and we'll be back in just a moment for some further discussion. Hello and you're very welcome back. Tonight we're here discussing that final great line of the Creed, I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And I'm here with Father Terence and next we're going to discuss a very important aspect of eternity, heaven. Father Terence, the Pope recently spoke in Spe Salve saying that maybe people mightn't necessarily want to spend an eternity in heaven because they have the wrong maybe image of it, maybe see it as eternity on earth. Could you maybe shine some light for us on what heaven is and how its relationship to the church is manifested. We have some beautiful images given to us by the saints over the centuries of this great communion of the saints gathered around Our Lady and Christ. With some very glorious, inspiring, uplifting and hopeful images. And I wonder maybe you could tell us a little bit about it. Pope Benedict XVI in Spe Salvi essentially referred to the, the notion of eternity and how eternity is often perceived by people in a a way that is related to earth, that it simply goes on and on and on, and therefore that, that heaven would become a place of boredom. Mm. And what we, of course, what we know is, is that God lives outside of time, and therefore eternity for God is not the same as eternity is for us, for those of us who are watching our watches and yes. uh, watching the clock, that we, we, we live within time, whereas God lives outside time. Therefore eternity is not the same for God as for us, but is for him, it's, it's an eternal now. Mm -hmm. And therefore, issues of, of boredom and so on have, have nothing to do with, with heaven, which is essentially the, the gift of being able to see God, what, what we would call the beatific vision, the, yes. the vision of, of the blessed. So that's what the Pope was trying to teach us, is that heaven is a place of very simple joy in the very simple beauty of, of God himself that it's, it's not a place of, of constant entertainment in which we are uh, liable to become bored, but uh, a place of very simple and very profound joy in eternity, simply because of our presence there in the Lord and simply because of the wonder, really, of God, a wonder that's beyond all our understanding. So, Father Terence, then heaven's relationship within the church and the life of the saints, how, how, how do they all interrelate? One of the important principles in, in Christian theology is the idea of that what Christ has accomplished, he has accomplished it now, mm. but it is not yet fully accomplished. 
So, so we live in a time which is between the, the now and the not yet. Mm. For example, we have received the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit in baptism and confirmation and the other sacraments in various ways, but we haven't yet received the fullness of the Spirit, which will only come at the end of time when the Spirit raises our, our bodies in such a way that, that they can no longer possibly decay because they're so filled with the Spirit of life. So St. Paul in, uh, in the eighth chapter of the letter to the Romans, when he speaks about the, the Spirit and the gift of the Spirit, he, he relates it to something that has already happened and at the same time something that will, will come in the future too. And often one of the, well, one of the images which we have is, is the image of the dawn, that mm -hmm. we live in the time of the dawn where we do see the light, but only a very little bit of the light, whereas heaven will be the time of the noonday sun, yes. when everything will be seen in its radiant perfection and glory. And so the mass, for example, is the heavenly banquet, but like the dawn, it's only, we only see it in a very slight little way, okay. whereas in eternity to, to be there with the Lord, um, to this eternal banquet, we will see it in its full glory. And in the same way to the, the church, how is the church related to the assembly of the saints mm. in heaven? Well, the church is, is like the dawn. It's, it's the very first signs of life, the very first signs of this eternal life and happiness. And of course, in the, in the church, people who accept the faith fully um, are full of this, this uh, eschatological joy, yes. this, this joy which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, a gift of the Lord Jesus himself. And in heaven then, um, this will be brought to perfection. So, so the church is, in a sense, the assembly of the saints already, but awaiting its, it, her own perfection, her own uh, perfecting, her perfecting by Christ in, in the end of time. And of course, the saints have a role in our own lives today, despite the fact that they're in heaven. They're constantly interceding for us and helping us in our own sanctification. That's right. So the church, of course, is not made up simply of those of us who are here on earth, mm. but also those who have gone before us. Yes. And so we speak of the, of the church triumphant. Yes. And when we speak of the communion of saints, the, the sharing in, in holy things, we, we are really speaking of a communion between the saints and us, so that heaven is, is never too far away in that sense, but the saints are, are there with us and, um, as you say, they're helping us on our way. Yes. As the preface of the Mass for, for the common of saints, who are pastors tells us th that the saints instruct us by their preaching and help us by their prayers so okay. that we are learning from the saints yes. by, by reading them, by getting to know them, but they are also active helping us as we, as we speak. Father Terence, yeah. you've been speaking to us quite a lot about heaven, which is our eternal reward and what we're all hopefully, please God, headed towards. But as you mentioned earlier, our Lord is uh, an intrinsic part of our, our, our death is judgment and we can go to purgatory as you say a time of preparation for encounter with the love of Christ the love of God or to heaven but on the other side then there is hell can you maybe tell us maybe we, we have a lot of biblical texts and Christ's own words that tell us about hell but maybe put it within the context of where we're called to and what's the possibilities for us and um, what hell is really in when the catechism is, is speaking about hell it begins by, by saying that nobody is going to be saved by Christ except by their own free choice. Okay. And therefore, it's, it's giving a, forth a principle which is already there in St. Augustine, that God has created us without mm. our choice. Mm. We're simply here, thanks to the choice of God. But he won't save us without our choice. Yeah. So that, that we ha ourselves have to make a, a choice to be saved by the Lord. And when Jesus speaks about hell in the Gospels, one of the very striking images that he uses is that he speaks of it as being a place of weeping and grinding of teeth. Mm. And very visual image. It's a very visual image and also something that we can relate to quite easily. Yeah. I think that uh, he's talking about the, the stress that's there and uh, the weeping, the, re the regret, yeah. the grinding of teeth, the, the stress and the, the sort of, what really, you really get the impression that he's talking about a place where people are closed in on themselves, yeah. on their regrets, on their stresses, on their, um, their sorrows of their own life. Whereas what we are called to as Christians is that while we bear all these things, we offer them to Christ. We open ourselves up to Christ 
and therefore the, the Christians aren't different from others in terms of the difficulties that we bear. Mm. But rather than allowing these difficulties to, to close us in on ourselves, in our sorrows and our regret and our selfishness and all these things, we, we offer them to the Lord. And that, that is what really makes the difference. I think when Jesus speaks about hell as being a place of weeping and grinding of teeth, it, it's, it's very significant that what he's pointing to is a place of people who are closed in on themselves. And this is the importance really of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, that it, it's an invitation to people to see that there is a much greater reality than simply themselves yeah. and, and their own worries, which is, which is God, God himself. And therefore, the church, of course, is only theorizing about this. What she knows for sure is that there is such a thing as hell, a, a place of eternal separation from God. How this happens in, in the context of, a, of an infinitely loving God is the great mystery. Mm. But in some way or other, it's, it's the choice of those who, who see God to flee from God back into themselves, that, that wow. while the Lord calls them forth yeah. to out of themselves and uh, to, to offer everything to him, that, that the opposite choice is made. And of course, we can see this also in daily life here on earth, that so many people are, are offered the gospel, are offered the, the beauty of, of knowing Jesus, and instead they turn away to uh, little knickknacks or to their own uh, yeah. selfishness. And, yes. um, and therefore, in, in a sense, we already experience hell on in this life, mm. if, if we don't uh, open ourselves to the Lord, the, this, the stress and the worries that, that a confidence in the Lord and a trust in the Lord would take away. So, so hell is, is um, very much a reality. And at the same time, th it's faced with the Christian message. The Christian message is seen really in, in all its starkness in, mm. in terms of the doctrine of hell as, as an invitation to, to open ourselves to that a great infinite beauty and, and love of the Lord, which hell is precisely the, the neglect of or the yes. refusal of. You certainly put that in a very good constructive light, you know, that we see it in the context of opening ourselves and coming to Christ and not pulling back and retracting. Oh, it's, it's very interesting there as you describe the purification that goes on in purgatory, that ascendance of that purification goes on here on earth. And in a similar way, then with hell, it regards our selfishness and self-centeredness. Yeah. We prepare ourselves for, in, for moving in that direction here on earth as well. So really it's here as part of the church um, here and now that we kind of, we set in motion through our own will, as you said, um, where, what, what way and how our orientation to God is. So exactly, and therefore to a large extent, the everlasting life that we profess our faith in mm. has of course always already begun here. That, that we are already living, we're already, yeah. uh, we know we have come from the hand of God, fashioned by him in our very creation. And therefore, that, that life is, is already underway. And we are already forming ourselves through the invitation of the gospel and through, through the grace of the sacraments to, to become like Christ, to, to choose Christ, to choose um, Christ who gives us the gift of, of everlasting life already here, here in the here and now. Here now. And so one of the great themes, of course, of, of the both Old and New Testaments in the scriptures is precisely that we will be judged according to our deeds, mm. according to what we have done. And therefore, uh, why is that? Well, it's, it's precisely because our eternity has already begun in the here and now and mm. how we fashion ourselves to make ourselves ready for, for eternity um, in either hell, heaven, hell or purgatory is, is something that we're already underway, that we're already beginning to accomplish here, here in this life. So just speaking there about the saint's role in our own sanctification got me thinking of two very important saints for, for me as a Dominican. St. Teresa of Lisieux, the little flower, um, that great worker of miracles, and of course our own founder, St. Dominic, who both on their deathbed said to those around them that it would be more helpful to them after their death. So I think it's very reassuring of that constant care and presence of the saints aiding us in our lives. Yeah. I think what, what we're talking about there as well is, <coughs> is the, the solidarity of the saints with us, mm. that there is within the communion of saints a great solidarity. And the, the saints in heaven making use of, of their uh, greater appropriation, you could say, of the, the power of Christ, who, who they see face to face, uh, are, make use of their solidarity with us in a very special way to, to help us on our way much more even than we, we can help each other mm. here on earth. 
And of course, that, that solidarity then calls forth a solidarity for, from us too, which is sure. precisely what, when we speak of praying for the souls in purgatory, mm. precisely it's that solidarity that, um, that we are called to ourselves. Just that w speaking there about the saints reminds me of that chaplet that we often pray to St. Dominic in times of need and exams for us as students. And it, it ends with, or it's a, a frequent line, and it is, Fulfill, O Father Dominic, what thou hast said, and help us by thy prayers. Mm -hmm. So it's um, asking to fulfill that and to, to, to remember us. But uh, that's beautiful with regards to the solidarity with, with, with not just the saints, but us, but our, our care and our prayer for the, 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 the souls in purgatory. Yeah. And, our, and our, our duty of concern towards them, I suppose, as well. Yes, and it's also a reminder as well that the love of God is, is itself so rich mm. that it doesn't simply express itself in the love of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, but also in, through the saints. Yes. That, that part of the love of Christ is, is the love that is given to us through the grace that is given to the saints. And therefore, the, the love of the saints for us and our love for the saints all ties in beautifully uh, and very powerfully with, yeah. with our belief in the, in the love of Christ. Yeah, little glimpses himself. of God's eternal love there in each of the saints. Beautiful. Yes. And um, just before we finish, I wonder if you could maybe say something about that very small word that we say so often as Christians, Amen. And I understand it's a fairly ancient word that may be Hebrew in origin, but um, you might want to maybe say something to us about it if you could. Yeah, it's, it's related to the, the verb in Hebrew, which is the verb to, to trust to, to uh, have confidence in somebody and essentially means that, that we trust in that and, and that we affirm it by, by our trust in it. So uh, it's already there in, in the prophet Jeremiah when uh, the prophet Hananiah is making a, a prophecy. Uh, Jeremiah says, Amen, I wish it were true. Mm. And for us, really the, the essence of Christian faith is to trust. Mm. It's to, to, to trust that what the Lord has said is true and that what the Lord has revealed is true. And therefore, the, the Amen at the end of the creed is in fact a beautiful uh, coda, a beautiful statement in itself that affirms everything that has come to us through the creed, the story of uh, the life of Christ, the affirmation of God as Father, the affirmation of our own salvation and the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. That to all these things we, we say to the Lord at the end that I trust in them. But I trust that the Lord has, has told me these things and therefore I say Amen. Wonderful. Such a small word but so rich so and deep meaning. meaning. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. And on that positive note, we'll end this series of Credo. If you have any ideas on any future series we might run, please log on to our website and let us know. So thanks very much and God bless.